Hello, I'm Mark Unkefer, and I'm Executive Director of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association, and welcome to our monthly, uh, our October webinar. Uh, this month, we feature uh, the work product of our Technology Committee, which is one of the more active committees of uh, within the Fiber Optic Sensing Association, and it is a presentation that they've put together and also presented already uh, to folks in the insurance and risk management industry, but this time we're making it available more broadly, and it focuses on risk ma management opportunities through fiber optic sensing. Uh, and we have as our presenter, uh, Gareth Lees, who is the uh, spent now two years, it probably seems longer than you, but it's been coming up on two years as chairman of a technology committee and has done a lot of very active work in sort of diverse projects uh, in uh, advancing fiber optic sensing. So Gareth, we're looking forward to uh, hearing more about uh, how uh, uh, risk can be mitigated uh, with with uh, fiber optic sensing. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Mark. Um, hopefully you can all uh, hear me and see my slides. Um, as Mark said, uh, my name is Gareth Lees. Um, I'm the uh, chairman of the um, uh, technology committee chair for FOSA and, and the CTO for AP Sensing. And today I'm going to talk about risk management uh, through fiber optic sensing. So first of all, just a, a brief overview of the kind of presentation. So I'll start with a, an introduction to FOSA, um, let you know uh, what we do as an organization and who we are. Uh, this was uh, this photo was taken at uh, one of our annual meetings when we could travel uh, in, Was in Washington, um, 2019, I think. Um, I'll go on to introduce fiber optic sensing kind of as a, as a general concept and then in more detail about the kind of instrumentation and the technologies behind temperature measurements, strain measurements and acoustic measurements. Uh, I'd love to be able to have the time to talk to you about all the fabulous things that are going on in uh, installation of cables and cable design and all of the, 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 the hard work which is going on to get the fibre into the ground and where we need it to do our measurements. But unfortunately, uh, in an hour, that's not going to be possible. Uh, there are some great webinars in this webinar series from um, our members on uh, installation technologies. So if you're interested in that kind of area, please go and uh, take a look at those webinars. I'm going to be spending the second half of the presentation talking about case studies, uh, in particular um, fire detection, uh, power cable monitoring, uh, pipeline monitoring and rail monitoring. Uh, these are kind of four big areas. Um, there's, I could, literally, we could spend days talking about the different application areas, but uh, these are the kind of uh, big ones at the moment and uh, some really nice examples and case studies to show how fiber optic sensing can be used uh, to, to manage risk. So just a bit about FOSA. So um, FOSA was formed in 2017 in Washington. Uh, we're an industry group um, and the aim of the group is to um, get out there and promote fiber optic sensing technology um, and we do that through um, taking all of our combined knowledge and our shared resources and trying to educate people who don't know about fiber optic sensing um, to what it can offer uh, and what we can do with the technology, which is a very diverse um, range of applications. Um, we also have quite a large um, part of our website, which is um, um, has a lot of technical content. We generate documents uh, such as um, we have one page primers on all of the technologies. We also have installation considerations in there uh, for all the different application areas. So there's a lot of um, publishing of documents which help uh, explain to people how they can use fiber optic technology. We're 23 members at the moment. Um, and uh, one of the great things about FOSA, and one of the things I like about the organization is that we've got a really diverse range of companies who are members. Um, from um, instrument providers uh, to universities uh, to people who uh, install the cables and, and make the fiber and the cables themselves. So it's a really nice, diverse bunch of companies who, who are members. Um, we're very active and uh, you can see that from our LinkedIn channel and, and our YouTube channels. Uh, we put out a webinar every month um, and uh, they're, they're really interesting. Even uh, as a kind of an expert in the field, I find that I'm learning more watching uh, the webinars from our member companies. So risk, risk management. Um, so everybody's probably um, heard of uh, risk management. Um, we've all kind of maybe done risk assessments. Um, but what is risk? Um, the, the most 
used uh, definition is that the risk is the likelihood of something happening uh, multiplied by the consequences of that event occurring. Um, and if you've ever done a uh, risk assessment, you're probably familiar with that kind of matrix below uh, where you have a likelihood of something happening, sometimes a probability, sometimes a bit vaguer, like maybe, uh, maybe not. Um, and then along the top, things like severity or consequences. And again, depending upon which um, um, industry area you're based in, that can either be monetary um, or, or some other um, arbitrary scale. But generally, it's an application and maybe even company specific how you rate the severity of a, a risk. Um, the ISO uh, th uh, three, um, 31000 has a, another risk definition, which is supposed to be a kind of a bit of a forward looking uh, definition, um, which is the, the effect of uncertainty on objects. Um, I suggest you go and look that up. Um, uh, um, there's uh, plenty about it on the website. Uh, it's it's a, um, a more broader term than um, the, the, the conventional definition, I suppose. Um, but there is one definition which uh, I like in particular uh, is that risk is the possibility of something bad happening. Um, and that's from the, the Cambridge Dictionary. And uh, as we kind of go through the presentation, uh, I'll try and highlight all of the fiber optic um, technologies and how they can help reduce the possibility of something bad happening and uh, uh, that's kind of what this presentation is about. So just a, a brief overview of what distributed fiber optic sensing is about. Um, I've taken, uh, if you look at the, the, the picture at the top, I've taken the kind of the, the generic asset, the, the generic long linear asset, uh, which could be many uh, tens if not hundreds of kilometers long. Um, Alongside that asset, um, and you'll find that um, whether it's a railway or a pipeline or a power cable, inevitably there'll be some form of fiber optic cable um, either within the installation itself, within the asset in case of power cables, um, or running alongside. And the reason that's usually there is for telecoms purposes. So different parts of the asset infrastructure can talk to each other. Um, the great thing about that is that uh, as a fiber optic sensing company, you can come along and, and utilize that existing fiber to do all kinds of great sensing. Um, so if we put um, an optical interrogator, um, a generic name for temperature sensors, strain sensors or, or whatever, uh, fiber optic sensor essentially, uh, in the center of your asset or at either end, you can then monitor the fibers. Now, the advantages of fiber optic sensing um, is that Along this fiber, you, you have a measurement at each point. So if it's a temperature sensor here, you have a, a measurement every one or two meters along that cable uh, continuously, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, year in, year out. So you're getting continuous rapid measurements of, of in this case, in this example, is of temperature along the, the fiber. Uh, the other things about it is that, you, you know, you, you're scanning the entire length every second and getting the measurements and there's, there's not a lot of other technologies that can do that and the, the range it can be like i said many, many tens if not hundreds of kilometers other advantages of fiber optics is that okay you're utilizing the pre-existing fiber but it's uh, it's the fiber is relatively passive there's no active components there's no electronics needed along the fiber so if you can put your optical interrogator in a central control room then the only thing you're using out in the field locations, which are possibly quite remote, is the actual fiber itself. Uh, and because there's no electronics, uh, inherently it's more reliable. Uh, the, the glass in the fiber, uh, there are installations out there which are, are 30 plus years old. Um, so the fiber itself um, degrades very, very slowly. Um, so the, I mean, the take home from this slide is that given the, the, the volume of sensing points, um, there's no real um, more economical way to monitor these long assets, regardless of what it is, um, uh, than optical fiber sensing. It uh, really is a, a flexible and um, a unique kind of uh, proposition for monitoring long assets. So um, as I kind of go through the presentation, I split um the applications up to, into these nine areas um and i think they cover most of the applications 
you'll see later in the presentation that although there's nine areas, they, they cover a huge amount and a huge variety of kind of sub applications. Um, so there's uh, a pipeline monitoring, um, which is anything from leak detection to monitoring the, the temperature of fluids in a pipe. Uh, third party intrusion and security, uh, that's uh, long fences, uh, airport security, anything where there's a long uh, border or, or security fence. Geotechnics can be earthquakes, it can be landslides, um, transport monitoring. Um, there's a lot of work on rail monitoring at the moment, but this could also apply to roads uh, and traffic monitoring um, and, and smart cities. Oil and gas in well monitoring. Uh, there's a, a, an ongoing discussion in the community that uh, um, there's actually probably more fiber in oil and gas wells than any other application, sensing application. It, it was one of the early adopters of fiber optic sensing and uh, a lot of oil wells do contain optical fiber. Um, and there's a lot of intervention services and a lot of cables. So oil and gas is a big market um, for fiber optic sensing. Industrial process monitoring, that can be anything from kind of LNG um, storage um, through to monitoring vessels, heat vessels, um, furnaces, for example, through to uh, monitoring uh, nuclear power stations and inside reactors. Um, the fiber itself can be radiation hardened, so it's quite a nice application to monitor inside of uh, um, nuclear reactors. Structural health monitoring, um, reasonably obvious, uh, dams and bridges and, and large structures. And then finally, power cable monitoring, um, overhead power cables, uh, buried power cables, and subsea power cables. So they're kind of the, the, the nine, I would say, core markets uh, for fiber optic sensing. Um, I always like to kind of look back, uh, people, you know, if, if you're not connected directly with the industry, People assume it's a new technology, and, and if, you're, if you're really new to the technology, uh, why you haven't really heard of it before. But the reality is, is that the kind of concepts we use uh, were discovered at the, the, the latter end of the 19th century. Um, there was some uh, fantastic physics going on um, in the 1880s up towards the, you know, the, the, the early 20th century. And the, the, the kind of technologies I'm going to talk about all use physical principles discovered by these three guys. Sometimes uh, controversially discovered by, um, I believe in some of these cases, there's uh, um, some discussion as to whether somebody else discovered it before. But uh, these are the guys that the techniques are named after. Um, so the Baron Rayleigh um, uh, discovered uh, Rayleigh scattering um, by looking at how light and, and, and glasses uh, interacted with each other. Um, C.B. Raman was Raman scattering. Again, how light and, and media interact with each other. There was a lot of really interesting stuff regarding the interaction of light and matter in this kind of period of time. And finally, uh, Leon Brewer, um, who discovered Brewer and scattering. Um, so, how did we get from that kind of early uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries to, to kind of where we are now? Um, well, we had a, a couple of kind of uh, big um, um, periods of time where nothing happened. Um, and then we had a huge telecoms growth um, in the late 1990s, um, where there was huge advances in technology such as lasers, uh, optical amplifiers, optical fibers themselves, um, much lower loss, enabling us to go further. And uh, for a lot of the, the, the techniques we're, we're using nowadays, uh, a huge growth in uh, high-speed electronics and high-speed digitizers. Uh, on top of that, uh, more recently, there's been a huge growth in the amount of data we're pushing around. Um, and therefore, techniques like machine learning have started to come back in uh, and GPU processing. Uh, and there's a lot more tools available now to kind of do really advanced uh, maths, um, which you wouldn't have dreamed of 20, 30 years ago. So over the last 20 years, um, um, since the kind of the telecoms boom, uh, the, the start of the, the, the 20th century, um, there's been a 21st century. There's been a great um, exponential growth in the amount of uh, research papers and public, uh, patents which have been coming out of this industry. And the, in, over the last 20 years, um, there's been outstanding change in, in all of these kind of technologies which I'm going to speak about. And uh, that's kind of turned the technology from um, research based to be a much more mature technology. Um, and uh, you'll see from some of the slides that. 
you know, a, a lot of um, those early um, prototypes and the bugs, which were in the 1980s and 1990s, they've all been ironed out and we've got a really mature base of technologies now. So on, on to those technologies. So uh, one of the first ones, which was uh, first discovered in 1984, um, was uh, a Raman-based uh, distributed temperature sensing. Um, I will say that you, the Brillouin effect can also be used uh, as DTS, um, as a distributed temperature sensor. Um, but if I, I start off by looking at the, the diagram at the top, um, you'll see a, a similar diagram on a, a lot of the slides, because all the techniques I'm going to talk about rely upon essentially the same principle. Uh, a pulse of light is launched down the fiber, um, and as that light travels, light is backscattered and picked up on a detector, uh, and then the data is visualized. Um, essentially, it's uh, analogous to a, a radar. Um, a radar sends out pulses, ele electromagnetic pulses. They get reflected from um, aircraft and other things, um, and the time of flight from the radar station to the, the um, the object and then back again gives you the distance and then they can triangulate. Effectively what we have is a one-dimensional radar. We send our laser pulse down and we look at what comes back. In this case we're, we're talking about Raman scattering. Um, the plot in the bottom right is a kind of a, a cartoon of the, the spectrum which is returned. So if I use a laser with this wavelength, uh, what, what uh, CV Raman discovered was that that light is scattered into sidebands. Um, and these sidebands are temperature sensitive. So essentially what we do in a Raman DTS is we, we have a filter um, around these bands and we look at the intensity of the signals. So as the temperature increases, the intensity goes up and as it decreases, uh, signal goes down. Um, and uh, as I said, the, the, position, the positional accuracy is the speed of light along the fiber and back again. So by measuring this amplitude, we get the temperature, and by measuring the time of flight, we get the distance. And this can be happening um, many thousands of times a second, uh, depending on the length of your fiber. So it's a really nice, um, straightforward um, measurement uh, for, for temperature along the fiber. Um, strain sensing or, or, or uh, using Brillouin scattering uh, for strain sensing um, relies upon the same kind of scattering kind of concept, but instead of looking at these Raman bands, we look at these Brillouin bands. Uh, again, we send a pulse of light along the fiber and we, we look at what's coming back. Um, and these, unlike the Raman, instead of the amplitude changing, we see a frequency shift with temperature. So as the temperature increases, um, the frequency goes up, and as it decreases, it goes down. Um, and you have a band on either side and they're, they're kind of symmetric. Um, these are examples from kind of real world systems. So you can see the temperature is increasing from minus 25 up to 90 degrees. And you can see the Brillouin frequency is shifting uh, up in frequency. And the amplitude is also changing. Um, and the bottom 3D plot kind of shows the positional um, um, element. Um, there is a fiber which is uh, nominally at this temperature and a section has been heated, and therefore you see the spectrum shift to a, a different frequency. Um, as I've kind of put on this plot here, um, one of the, 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 uh, the benefits of uh, Brillouin scattering is that it's sensitive to temperature and strain, uh, but that's also one of the negatives because it's, it's difficult or you have to do different things to uh, find out the temperature and the strain. But Brillouin can be used as um, temperature of strain or temperature and strain. And the next slide uh, basically just gives some examples of um, how you can um, separate the two. So uh, one of the most common ways of separating the two is to, with a Brillouin system, on one particular fibre you would measure temperature only by putting the fibre in a, in, a, in a large tube. So that fibre, if it's attached to something, uh, an asset, um, if the acid is strained, that fibre wouldn't see the strain. It would only be sensitive to temperature. And then there's usually a corresponding fibre which is closely coupled to the acid, which is sensitive to temperature and strain. And by measuring those two fibres, you can then uh, invert that matrix and uh, figure out what temperature and strain is. Um, so that's quite a common way of doing it. And there are other techniques, um, such as measuring the amplitude as well as the frequency shift. 
Um, uh, again, that's a reasonably um, good way of doing it. Um, it. It does have a slight impact on the noise performance, but it's a perfectly valid way of doing it. And actually, some applications just don't mind that there's a dependence. So a lot of structural health applications where they're looking at reasonably dynamic changes in strain, they can neglect the thermal influences uh, because a lot of the time they're, they're negligible and uh, they're seeing much bigger effects from the strain change. So there are a lot of ways to, comp uh, you know, to, to, to compensate for the fact that the system is sensitive to strain and temperature. And to add confusion, there's lots of different ways of doing grill room um, um, fiber optic sensing. So I've just got a few of the acronyms down there. Uh, and if you want to look at the webinar later and uh, look them up on the web, um, the BOTDA and BOTDR are the most common, I would say, and then uh, optical frequency domain and optical coherence domain methods as well. Um, but they all have advantages and disadvantages, but there are different techniques. Um, finally, acoustic sensing. Um, we have that diagram again um, where we have a probe pulse and we look at what comes back. Uh, the difference with distributed acoustic sensing is that the laser um, is what we call a highly coherent laser. It has a, a very narrow line width, so spectrally it's very pure. Um, it consists of um, um, not a single frequency, um, but it, it's a very narrow line width laser um, rather than some of the other techniques which can accommodate uh, much more you know, uh, relaxed tolerance on the line width. Um, and what happens in the acoustic sensing um, is, uh, and I don't know if anybody, you know, if anybody has laser pointers, but if you reflect a laser pointer off, uh, off your desk onto the wall, um, you'll see a speckle pattern. And then if the desk moves, the speckle pattern will change. Um, and the, in the simplest form, that's what we have in an acoustic sensor. We shine a very coherent laser along the, the glass, along the fibre, and it gets scattered back. And what we get back is a one dimensional um, speckle pattern. And if I um, disturb the fiber at a certain location, the speckle pattern changes. Um, and the, the detector here can, um, again, time of flight gives the position. Um, but if we look at the speckle pattern, um, we can use the detector to tell that something's happening at, uh, at that location. So it's a, a, a really powerful technique, actually, and you can use it to. Um, do a lot of uh, clever things, a lot of clever, um, it's not just um, a, um, a vibration sensor because it, it's effectively measuring the length of the fiber or changing length of the fiber. It can also be used to detect thermal events as well um, and strain events. Um, just a, a bit of background on distributed acoustic sensing and actually just to show you the kind of speckle pattern um, you could see, uh, this was 1984, uh, and back at uh, that time, um, uh, which was before my time as well, um, this speckle pattern, this kind of uh, um, coherent and destructive interference was considered to be a problem. Um, and a lot of work was done to remove it so that, that they could use um, the technique for OTDR measurements. So um, this was always considered to be a problem. But uh, nowadays we've kind of taken uh, this kind of basic technique um, and there's more um, exotic techniques where we, we combine the, the, the speckle pattern with a carrier frequency um, and that carrier frequency can give you um, linear changes in the length of the fiber. So if you measure the phase of a carrier then it, that varies linearly with the changing fiber length. So anything which changes the fiber length changes the phase of a carrier and therefore you can use distributed acoustic sensing to detect it. Uh, it's rather unfortunate naming because uh, it, it's so much more than a, just an acoustic sensor. Um, it's, uh, the real name should be a, a distributed Rayleigh sensor or a distributed change of fiber length sensor. Um, doesn't sound quite as good but uh, um, distributed acoustic sensing kind of pigeonholes it into acoustics and that's not the case in a, in a lot of instruments. Um, this, this is always a, a challenge because uh, at the end of talking about technology, people want to know what, what, what can the technology do. Um, and I'd say that, you know, uh, the reality is, is that um, by the time this webinar probably gets put up on, on, on YouTube and, you know, we've all had time to digest it, new things will have come out. And uh, the, the technology is changing quite rapidly and 
there's a lot of advances coming, um, uh, you know, almost monthly from the various vendors. So it, as soon as uh, this is kind of put onto a slide, it's almost out of date. But I would say that there's quite a few review papers out there uh, where you can go and you can see roughly what the technologies can do. And then uh, all I can advise is that you speak to the vendors because, you know, usually the data sheet has flexibility in it and we can all do things with our technology um, if there's a particular application or, or a particular specification that you need. Um, the, the, I put a couple of references in and the references are at the, the, the back of the presentation, um, but there are, there are quite a few uh, papers out there which lump um, these nice tables together. I, I'll just pick a few, I've kind of highlighted a few. So uh, Raman DTS, you can see the typical ranges actually on all of the table is anywhere from two kilometers up to kind of just over 30 kilometers. Um, that's fairly typical of, of Raman DTSs. Um, there, you know, vendors are out there that can go further, that's fine. Um, usually um, something else has to give, either the spatial resolution or temperature resolution or acquisition time. So there's trade-offs between all of these kind of parameters. Um, Brillwin-based sensors, uh, they tend to be longer range and you can kind of see that from the table. Um, again, from kind of 10 kilometers up to 80 kilometers, that's kind of a, a sweet spot for kind of Brillwin sensors. Um, again, with varying um, uh, specifications and there's usually trade-offs between the specifications. Um, in this particular case, the spatial resolution looks quite long for the long sensing ranges, but that's not always the case. Um, and then uh, ray sensors or, or phase OTDR or distributed acoustic sensors. Um, here, you know, there's a 40 and 100 kilometers um, uh, with very spatial resolutions. Uh, but like I say, uh, th this is just a snapshot of when this particular paper was published and uh, the, the best way of finding out whether the technologies can meet your requirements is to talk to the vendors. Okay, um, on to the applications. Um, so I kind of highlighted at the start these kind of nine um, blocks of applications. And what I've tried to do on this slide is kind of take those nine blocks uh, and uh, put the technologies alongside and see which technologies can do um, um, which things within each kind of block. And you can see that there's a huge diversity of applications there. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about conveyor belt monitoring, and then we've got heat tracing in pipelines, uh, we've got landslides, uh, deformation um, of dams. So the, there's a huge variation in what the, so, um, the technology can be used for. And uh, I'm only going to talk about a small portion of these things. So the first section of applications is going to be uh, fire detection. So they're mainly around DTS products. Um, and I'm going to talk in particular about tunnels, conveyor belts uh, and infrastructure, because I think that covers quite a nice um, um, section of the applications. Um, so tunnels. Um, Fiber optic sensing in tunnels has been around for many, many, many years. It's a, it's a, a conventional, um, we have a, a saying, bread and butter um, application. Um, fiber optics is used very widely in monitoring of tunnels, especially in Europe and in the Far East. Uh, the fiber optic is uh, usually suspended from the ceiling um, from some, some ties, so it's slightly displaced from the ceiling. Um, obviously heat rises um, and then the, the, the fiber optic sensor can pick up that heat uh, and raise an alarm. Uh, in this case, it's uh, a case study from the Eisenhower Johnson tunnels, uh, which are just outside Denver, Colorado. Um, it's a really heavily used tunnel, um, especially in the winter. It's the gateway to the ski resorts, I believe. Um, 30,000 vehicles per day pass through the tunnel. Um, and uh, a linear heat detection system was installed in 2015. Um, in 2019, there were, there were two fires during that year. Um, and, and in both cases, the fiber optic uh, heat detection system um, triggered the sprinklers, uh, orientated the cameras and helped to um, uh, contain the fire into an area where we can wait for the, the conventional um, firefighters to arrive. So the aim of the, the, the linear heat detectors is to, to contain the fire uh, and give um, the firefighters enough time to come and, uh, and extinguish the fire. Um, so they, it's really successfully used. 
um, the fiber having been immune to any kind of electromagnetic interference, uh, pretty much immune to everything except for uh, heat in the case of Raman scattering. Um, it's a really nice application, and very widely used. Uh, in terms of tunnels, uh, another tunnel, um, a different tunnel, uh, a rail tunnel in this case is the Euro tunnel. Um, again, a lot of people go through the Euro tunnel, 20 million passengers per year. Um, and again, um, uh, it's protected by uh, fiber optics uh, and fiber optic linear heat detection systems, uh, which are installed in cabinets along the wall. Um, and the linear heat detection systems um, are used to activate the high pressure water fire suppression systems. So uh, in that case, if a fire does break out um, in any of the areas, uh, the, the fire suppression system is automatically um, activated. So uh, again, another really nice application. Uh, and in this particular tunnel where they're, they're obviously electric trains, again, that immunity to uh, electrical signals makes it perfect. And the, 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 I mean, the false alarm rate is incredibly low uh, for fiber optic sensors. Um, another um, application, and it, again, it's, you know, it's, it's a different application, uh, is to use fiber optic sensing to monitor, in this case, airport hangars. But the same can be applied for any kind of large infrastructure. Um, and especially in this case, it's not necessarily the value of the hangar. It's more about the value of the, the aircraft which are in the hangar uh, that we're looking to protect. And actually, one of the benefits of fiber optics in this case is that um, the fiber is uh, attached to the, the trusses in the, in the roof um, and very accurate zones are set up. Um, and the, 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 the good thing there is that if a fire occurs in a zone, the fire suppression system, which in this case is, uh, is foam, is only activated in that particular area. Whereas the conventional sensors, which were infrared sensors, I believe, um, couldn't pinpoint the fire accurately enough um, to only isolate a certain zone. So uh, potentially um, conventional sensors would cause the entire hangar to, to fill with foam, whereas you can be a lot more targeted with fiber optic sensors and therefore protect the, uh, the, the aircraft and the, the contents of the hangar um, from the, 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 the potential fire. A conveyor belt monitoring is a, is a really interesting one because, uh, again, fiber optics um, sensors, uh, you know, really, uh, this is a perfect application for it. Um, in this case, it's a salt mine. Um, there's over 10 kilometers of fiber optic running through uh, throughout the salt mine, uh, monitoring for um, fires along the conveyor belts. And the fires build up because these bearings get very hot. Um, and as the bearings heat up, um, there they can they can set fire. So uh, the fiber optic cables run either side of the, the conveyor belt. Um, and again, in these kind of um, areas, there's a lot of uh, dust. Um, they're quite environmentally challenging. Um, and conventional techniques for fire detection, such as cameras uh, and point sensors, uh, either require a lot of maintenance in the case of uh, point sensors, or because of the contamination in the environment and the limited visibility, uh, cameras uh, struggle to operate as well. So actually, in this particular example, uh, the client had had some fires in the past in other facilities, and the de decision was made to install fiber optic sensors along the conveyor belts in this facility to, as a preventative measure from any fires breaking out in the future. And the aim is to catch the bearings uh, or the rollers heating up before they catch fire. Um, there's a, an illustration in the bottom right of uh, how you can visualize the various, uh, these are called bridges, which go from one facility to another, and they're carrying the salt. Uh, these bridges actually are typically made of wood in some cases, um, so they're, they're quite flammable. So uh, in this case, the, the fiber optic sensors are monitoring the bridges, um, but also then branching out into various other parts of the infrastructure as well. Um, and linear heat detectors, so DTS for fire detection, they are, it's a highly regulated industry. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to say that uh, uh, the fire products which are out there, um, all the certifications needed to be used for fire detectors um, in Europe, the US, and also in the Far East. 
So it's um, there's been a lot of effort over the last 10 years to get these certifications for linear heat detectors, fiber optic linear heat detectors. And I'm pleased to say that um, the, the technology has been approved for use um, for fire detection. Okay, so just to summarize um, from those last few slides. So in terms of fire applications, uh, it, it really is a mature technology. It's been used for many, many tens of years. Um, there's thousands of installations. Uh, um, certainly, uh, if you look at Europe and the Far East, um, that's where there's uh, many, many installations and it's quite widely used. Um, ranges up to 30 miles, 50 kilometers um, are achievable. Um, the fire can be localized very accurately with very fast alarming. And it's a really nice cost efficient way of providing um, long fire detection um, uh, equipment for long linear assets or big buildings. Okay, um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, power cable monitoring. Um, and uh, again, I've just picked three kind of uh, examples, um, which are, I'd say, quite common, um, but um, fault finding on power cables is one, and load management is another, um, and uh, um, transformer uh, monitoring and monitoring other infrastructure in, inside the uh, power generation facilities. Um, it's a standard kind of fire detection um, application. Uh, again, I'm starting off with a, a, the, a kind of a simple again bread and butter kind of application um, in this case it's a, a power cable connecting manhattan to queens um, there's fiber optic um, running with the power cable and the, the it's a temperature sensor uh, it's installed in a cabinet um, it's in an ip66 enclosure and what this system's doing is just monitoring the power cable for for hot spots but the clever thing is that it's using some uh, technique called real-time thermal rating. So it's feeding back that temperature information into some software, which is then adjusting the load on the cable. So you can optimize the load on the cable um, to the thermal properties of that cable. Um, if you have, it will also identify hotspots. So you can either carry out uh, mitigation measures on those hotspots um, uh, and prevent those hotspots from actually uh, damaging the cable. Um, and also, if you if you address all of the hotspots, then you can potentially you know, operate the cable more efficiently. So this is more of a proactive, uh, preventative application where you're, you're continuously monitoring the power cable for um, um, temperature and then using that to address the load. Uh, another good example, using the DAS technology um, in this case, um, so there is a subsea power cable um, and there, there is a, a fault on this particular subsea power cable and the DAS is being used to determine where that fault occurs. Um, because there's a fault, the cable isn't under load, but what, what can happen is that you can apply uh, pulses of high voltage to the cable and you can see where those pulses are, are detected by the DAS. They actually have a, they make um, uh, an acoustic or vibrational shock to the cable at the point of the damage. Um, in this case, you can see the, um, the, the boat uh, traveling over the cable. Uh, if you know from your DAS that it's occurring at the, um, this particular location fiber length, you can uh, drive your boat to exactly that location and see it on the, uh, on the screen that it's at the location of the, uh, the pulsing and you know exactly from a GPS point of view where your, where your fault occurs. Um, and also the kind of long range um, capability of DAS is you know, exceeding 50 kilometers and makes this quite a nice application. And this is a, a, another kind of um, uh, view of how we use DAS for fault finding. Um, so when faults occur, when a cable's in operation, a normal operation and a fault starts to occur, and you can get arcing occurring um, and that arcing is a, a it produces a hot spot on the cable but it also um, produces a vibration and it's also a precursor to a failure in the cable so if you're continually monitoring the the cable with das and ideally with dts as well for, for temperature hot spots and i'll go on to that in another slide um, you can then have a, um, an, a, a good advanced warning that your cable 
might be failing at a certain location. Uh, in this case, the cable again was used in, a, in an offline mode where the, 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 again, the thumping was happened. We applied a high voltage to the cable and uh, that high voltage was uh, detected by the DAS when arcing occurred between the, the core of the cable and the, and the insulator. So DAS can be used in a number of different ways for, for, um, for binding on power cables. Uh, this is a DTS example. Um, um, again, a long subsea power cable uh, in an offshore wind farm, uh, 50 kilometers long. Um, during the, the measurement, uh, these two plots are when the cable is not loaded and when the cable is under load. Um, there's about a 60 degree C difference between the, the non-loaded and the loaded cable. But uh, what you, you can see is that there are a series of cold spots and hot spots uh, along the, the cable. Um, uh, the cold spots are, are quite broad. Um, so they're, they're, this is kind of 100 meters. So they're, 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 they occur over quite a, a longish distance. Um, and they, they change over time. So this is a, a good indication of the, uh, the surroundings and the environment of the cable. And potentially in these areas, the cable is actually uncovered um, and therefore is experiencing the, the sea uh, directly and not insulated by the, 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 the sand or seabed. So uh, the, these areas here, uh, are potentially um, uncovered, exposed parts of the cable. Um, the kind of hotspots, um, some of these can be identified as cable joints, um, and they are, they, they look like this, they've got a, a certain level. Um, cable joints, they're, they're quite a complicated kind of um, environment for the, the power cable, there's extra insulation around them, so there's, uh, there's reasons for the temperature being hotter. But there was one hotspot in particular which didn't seem to have any reason for it being there. Um, and it was very narrow, um, so uh, down to the resolution of the instrument in this case. Um, and actually, uh, a number of weeks later, uh, the cable failed at exactly this location. Um, so this hotspot here, uh, had, had the system been running for longer, could have identified a, a hotspot. Um, and unfortunately, when the cable did fail, it was at a, um, a during the winter period where um, actually going offshore to fix the cable uh, was problematic because of the weather. Therefore, the, 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 it was the most inopportune time for the cable to fail. Um, and therefore, it, yeah, it cost a lot of money um, in terms of repair costs and also loss of production as well. So that's a really good example about how DTS can be used uh, for fault finding on power cables. Uh, I'd say that the combination of DAS and DTS I'm a firm believer that if you're having more, if you have more than one measurement, your level of confidence increases. So uh, at this location where we had a hot spot, if we were also seeing um, um, impulsive events on the DAS, uh, you would have a, a very good degree of confidence that you were seeing arcing and the heat generated by that arcing. And therefore, there was a potential fault with the cable. So in summary for, for the power cables, um, there are lots more applications which I haven't covered. Um, one of them which I kind of touched on was depth of burial of subsea cables and there's a lot of work ongoing to develop algorithms for actually uh, highlighting areas of cable uh, and actually figuring out how deep they're buried based upon uh, temperature changes. Um, we talked a bit about hot and cold spot developments in power cables but also there's a, a huge area of monitoring overhead power lines, the ice buildup, um, any kind of um, contact with the power cables where trees have grown over or encroached onto the, the power cable um, or just even, you know, people um, you know, uh, disturbing the, the lines, climbing up the pylons or whatever. Um, there's a, a lot of other applications around the power cables. Um, so on to more applications. So um, I'm going to talk now about um, Pipelines mainly, uh, but also a bit of third party intrusion and security. Um, so, pipelines, I mean, pipelines are, are fantastic because they're, they, uh, they're typically in remote locations, uh, they're, they're long, uh, they tend to have fibers running alongside them. So, it's a fantastic application for fiber optic sensors. And we can actually offer a lot of different measurements uh, for uh, pipeline monitoring. But I'll touch on a few of them during this presentation. 
Okay, so um, pipelines, there are a lot of them. Um, so just in the US alone, uh, there's nearly 800,000 kilometers of oil and gas pipeline, um, which is a phenomenal number. Um, and yes, there's not fiber optics along all of them. Um, and yes, some of them are, are quite short um, and small pipelines, but it's, it's a huge number. Um, and there's a lot of threats to them. Um, there's um, uh, just uh, your, your uh, farmers who just happen to be putting fences in or, or you know, um, doing some work on their land and then damage the, the pipeline with potentially catastrophic results. Um, there's security around block valves, where the valves come above the ground um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're visible and therefore people think that they can, uh, um, you know, uh, extract some product from the pipe in those locations. Uh, leak detection, uh, a lot of this pipeline infrastructure is quite old. Um, and corrosion becomes uh, an issue um, and leaks become a challenge. And then obviously security around facilities whether it's the very large refinery facilities or, or oil fields, or just even the block valves. Um, the, the DAS can be used in all of these kind of locations. Um, one of them's, um, uh, we'll go back to strain monitoring. Um, there's actually three applications on this slide. Um, so I'll, I'll go kind of through them in turn. So this is a case study um, on an LNG pipeline uh, in Peru. So it's obviously a, a critical pipeline. Um, LNG is quite a, a challenging um, substance to, to ship around. Um, and, and the environment's quite challenging through Peru as well. Um, there's a lot of ground movements, um, uh, incidents. Uh, and uh, this one on the, uh, the right-hand side. Um, so what happened here was uh, the, the, the strain sensor, which was installed alongside the pipeline, um, started to pick up ground or started to pick up strain. Um, which was essentially um, this section of land here um, slipping down the hill. Um, and because of the measurement, um, the, the client was able to go out and uh, install this barrier um, to stop the ground moving and therefore damaging the LNG pipeline. So again, this is a, a really good example of how the data can be used to then mitigate a, a potentially fatal um, um, damage to the pipeline. Um, over here, this, this section here, um, this kind of periodic signal, which you can see on this particular curve, um, this, this happens to be day-night changes. Um, and again, the, the, the other curves are just uh, at different points along the pipeline. But in, in this particular point, um, the pipeline's been exposed to day-night changes. So you, you can tell if your, fire, your, your pipeline or your cable has been exposed. Um, and that can happen in for loads of different reasons. Um, certainly where you're up, um, in, um, if you have a continual melting and uh, uh, of, uh, of ice, you can get washouts um, where the, the ice melts and, and washes the soil away from around your, your pipeline. Um, that's one good example. Um, or the, you know, there's ground movement, or there's been interference with the pipeline and the cable has been exposed. Um, and then you will see these day night changes in temperature a lot more clearly than if the cable was buried. And then at the top here, um, what this kind of pointed to was uh, um, uh, during kind of um, uh, a rainy season, water slips through the cracks uh, uh, and cools down the cable. So again, it was a, um, a, a good indicator that um, there's uh, additional soil erosion due to the rains and actually washing away the soil. Um, so it's in this case, it's just a, um, an alert that in this particular location, there could be more challenges in the future. So uh, it's a, a really nice case study of what strain sensing uh, and actually temperature sensing in these cases can offer um, pipeline operators. Uh, intrusion is a, a huge problem, um, actually trying to steal product. Uh, in this case, it's a case study from one of our members. Um, in just a six month period of time, there were 26 uh, hot tap attempts on a, on a pipeline in India. Um, and uh, you know, on the investigation of those events, there were, uh, you can see from the photo, that there was a quite large digging um, activity um, uh, and people you know, could then um, react quite quickly, go along um, 
and potentially capture the, and, and detain the people who are trying to dig up the pipeline. Uh, and apart from the fact it's quite a silly thing to do, um, it's uh, hot tapping into pipelines is not advised. Um, but kind of um, playing on from that, and the video may or may not work um, over this connection. Uh, but perimeter security is uh, um, a really big market for DAS. Um, in this case, uh, it's, if you can see it, it's showing somebody attempting to climb over a fence. Um, the, the interface has located that position um, and highlighted it on the map. Um, and you, you could, um, we've kind of missed it a bit now, but it will appear on the, the screen here. So the, the, there's something happening potentially many kilometers away from your instrument, and the instrument's identifying that, showing you exactly on the map where it's happening uh, and raising an alert. So perimeter security is a, a really strong market for, for DAS. Um, and there's a, a lot of vendors out there offering some fantastic uh, products. Um, and it, it's not just in this case, the fiber optics is installed on the fence, but you can also bury it. Um, and you, you can pick up um, vibrations in the ground from people walking or tunneling or, or vehicles. So there's lots of use cases for this kind of technology. Um, I put the links down, and again, they're in the references. So you can you can go um, to YouTube um, after the, the webinar and take a, a bit more of an in-depth look. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, videos in this series showing uh, the effectiveness of fiber optic sensing for perimeter security. Um, and again, one of the the, the, the simpler ones, um, but no less critical, is just measuring the temperature of what's inside your pipeline. There are a lot of applications where you're having to heat something up um, in order for the product to flow. So heavy oils and sulfurs and bitumen sands, um, they all need to uh, go into special pipelines which are insulated and then heated. Um, and obviously you're heating up um, a product and uh, you need to identify whether that heating is uniform along the pipe, whether there's any challenges of uh, hot spots or cold spots which could cause the um, the product to solidify again and cause blockages. So the optimization of these pipelines is critical to the operation. Uh, and even downtime of um, uh, you know, hours or days uh, causes quite a lot of loss of, uh, of product going through these pipelines. And it, in worst case, even damage to the pipeline uh, and having to replace sections of the pipeline and all that entails. And it's quite a complicated pipeline product. Um, and again, the visualization of the data is very key. Um, you get immediate responses of hot and cold spots on a, on a visual display. So again, very nice. Uh, in this case, it was 76 kilometers of the pipeline. Uh, the, the, the cable itself was rated to 250 degrees C. Um, so fiber optic technology can be used in high temperature applications with a one degree C resolution on one meter spatial. So in summary on pipelines, uh, again, it's an established technology. Uh, the main applications are leak detection because of, uh, of the, the criticality of that, um, the, the loss of product, the damage to the environment, the potential fatalities. Uh, so leak detection is, is one of the main application areas and quite rightly so, but uh, it's closely followed by third party intrusion and, and ground movement. Um, and things I haven't mentioned, pig tracking is one of them. Um, so there's regular pigging activity on pipelines to clean those pipelines and, uh, and monitor for corrosion uh, and DAS can be used to, to measure the lo location of those pigs, whether they've got stuck, and what time they're going to arrive at the next pig station, etc. Um, and all technology areas, um, the temperature strain and acoustics can be used for pipeline monitoring. So it's a, a really nice diverse application area. Um, and on to my final kind of application area, which is uh, transport monitoring. Um, and I'm going to kind of focus on train tracking or, or train monitoring. Um, again, uh, rail infrastructure is huge. Um, and it's only when you start to look at the numbers, you realize, you know, the kind of uh, the challenges um, involved. So in, again, in the US alone, there's uh, 226,000 kilometers of pipeline. Um, and a phenomenal figure is 5 billion passengers um, 2016, which is incredible. Uh, I mean, one of the, 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 the negatives is that um, in the US last year, there were nearly a thousand fatalities in railroad accidents. And it seems to be a number which is increasing. 
Um, so there's a lot of um, work going on at the moment for, for monitoring, for um, or automatic monitoring of crossings or railway crossings in the US to make sure that alerts can be raised when the train's approaching, for example. Um, but some of the more um, interesting ones are, are kind of looking at how DAS can be used to pick up. Um, and again, this is a preventative kind of application. Uh, we're looking for defects in the wheels. Um, under heavy braking and continuous braking, flats can occur on the wheels and they can cause uh, unnecessary vibrations uh, and failures potentially within the, the train um, carriage itself. Uh, and the DAS actually, because of the, the signal from the flat wheel is different from the rest of the train. Um, there's some really nice illustrations how flat wheels can be detected using DAS. Uh, in both these cases, you can almost, if this is the front of the train and the back of the train, you can almost identify where, exactly where that wheel leads on the train. Um, and then the same in this case. So it's a, again a really nice application and one which um, has come out because fiber optics are installed alongside a lot of um, train lines, especially um, certainly in the UK, uh, a lot of the fiber optic backbone of the UK was installed alongside the train lines. Um, so there's a, a large, huge sections of the, the train network which can be monitored with fiber optic sensing with no installation of fiber optics required at all. Uh, rail defects is another one. Uh, obviously, if there's cracks in the rail or damage to the rail uh, as the train travels over that crack, um, the, there's vibration, there's banging of the, the rails together um, and uh, impulsive acoustic events going into the ground and being observed from the, the, the cable. Uh, what, and that's what you see here. Instead of the vibrations being periodic along the train front, um, what you're seeing is as the train goes over the brake at this location, you're seeing the, the, the banging of the rail as it impacts on, on against each other. So again, that's another preventative um, measure. You can identify the, 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 the potential damage to the rail and you can stop the trains and potentially go out and uh, fix that, that damage. Uh, rock falls and landslides. Um, so this is uh, again a, a pretty huge landslide. Um, and uh, the, the DAS very clearly sees the landslide. Um, it's, a, it's a huge signal um, as, as the ground gives way and moves. Um, if the, again, if there was a strain sensor in here, you'd see huge changes in strain on the, on the fiber. But it just highlights that, you know, if you had a cable alongside and you have the monitoring technology attached to that cable, um, these kind of things can be identified well in advance of a train reaching that area. So in summary on the, the rail monitoring, there is, again, there's so many more um, applications out there, uh, which I haven't mentioned. Uh, there's some real nice webinars from some of our partner companies um, uh, with Infosa on um, rail monitoring um, that, you know, if you go and watch another one of those hour presentations purely on train monitoring, it'll give you a much broader idea of the applications. Um, but the, 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 the technology can offer a lot to, to, to rail monitoring. Um, and you know, I haven't really had time to mention uh, road monitoring, but again, uh, there's some um, presentations out there to look at how fiber optic sensors can be used um, to detect traffic movements and, uh, and accidents on roads as well. So um, I'm towards the end of my presentation and hopefully I'm reasonably on time. Yeah. Um, so hopefully I've kind of uh, given you a a really quick overview of the technology and that it, it's been around for many years and it's well established. Uh, there are many suppliers out there and there's a, a large body of uh, knowledge and history of, of successful projects and how the, the you know people, there's again, just look at YouTube, I mean it's fantastic, there's so many positive things out there on how fiber optic sensing has been used to the benefit of uh, different organisations. We can measure multiple things, and we've only mentioned strain, temperature, and vibration, uh, but we can measure magnetic fields, we can measure radiation, we can measure uh, anything which changes the properties of the fiber. Um, and also within a fiber, we can measure all of these things together, and having all of those measurements together can uh, be combined to have a lower false alarm rate. And the power cable one is a perfect example, measuring the acoustics and measuring the temperature. You've got two very independent measurements 
Um, and if they're both telling you that something's happening at that point in your power cable, then you've got a really good confidence that something is genuinely happening. Um, and what we're trying to do as an industry is to make sure that the technology gets installed before incidents occur, because there's a huge number of examples where after an incident has occurred, the, the technology has been installed. And uh, I was, you know, in terms of risk management, um, we'd like to see the technology being considered um, as a preventative measure rather than being put in after incidents happen. And there's, there is still significant growth in this area. Um, and further advances in technology, especially around uh, computational trends and high speed electronics, um, they're driving further and further advances in the technology. Um, very finally, I'd like to thank uh, the FOSA Technology Committee um, and also the FOSA leadership and staff for helping me out putting this presentation together. Um, and uh, just for the, for the YouTube, uh, here are the, the references. And thank you very much. If there's any questions. Well, thank you very much. We've covered a lot of uh, territory within an hour, so thank you very much, Gareth. We probably have time for only one question, and it actually is a, a how shall I say, a more, it starts with a philosophic premise, which is the definition of risk as being, quote, the second most subjective thing after love. Uh, and so ultimately, it becomes kind of a subject, subjective question as to whether or not to protect an asset. That said, can you give us a little feel for some of the metrics that are available for the risk reward for the insurance community and in, in suggesting that fiber optic sensing be included and that is a being a, a actualized in an infrastructure uh, installation and that that is a cost effective application yeah i could pick any one of a number of applications but i'm going to pick power cables um because it, it, it's it's just uh, it's blindingly obvious to the people who understand fiber optic technology that having fiber optic instrumentation monitoring your power cable um, is a really cost effective way of avoiding um, um, damages to that cable. Um, and those damages can occur for many different reasons. But the, if, you, if you have a, an export cable to a wind farm uh, and it stops working, then the losses soon mount up. Uh, phenomenally quickly if you, you know your wind farm um, can no longer if you happen to turn your wind farm effectively off or down because you can't export that electricity um, the, the losses are just day by day by day on top of you know having to then fix the cable which is on the bottom of the seabed um, you, it's the benefits of being able to say we think there's a fault on this cable um, we're going to reduce the load on that cable to see if it fixes or, or helps with that fault condition. Uh, we're going to increase the load on any other uh, parallel cables or any other export lines to compensate. Uh, and then we're going to plan a maintenance schedule for when the weather isn't um, the middle of winter. Um, and we're going to minimize our downtime. If you do those equations, um, the answer's pretty much always the same. Um, having that knowledge in advance rather than you know uh, you know looking at the data afterwards and saying oh well we you know um we, we had that data but we didn't really do anything with it um it's it really does it's stark it's uh, um you know the, the numbers the installation costs of a das and a dts on a power cable is the cost of the instrumentation at the uh, on the land side um and potentially in uh, some offshore locations but you know it, it it's dwarfed, the cost of doing that is dwarfed by the, the, the loss on repairing the cable uh, and losing that, uh, that revenue from the electricity from the offshore um, array. Well, uh, that's well thank you. One, um, yeah, sorry. That's one yeah. of many. And, and as you yeah. said, there, there are um, other resources available on the FOSA website and on the YouTube uh, channel to be able to track down applications, application specific. Uh, use cases. Uh, we're a little over the hour, so I think we'll stop there. We will also encourage yeah. folks to direct questions directly to you uh, and uh, or to FOSA, and we'll try mm -hmm. and uh, respond to that. Uh, just a reminder, uh, our next webinar will be on November 19th. Uh, member, FOSA member NBG will be uh, doing a presentation on new sensing capabilities 
uh, for metallic based fiber protection. So we have a, uh, an upcoming webinar coming up uh, in a little over a month. So thank you. And just for a reminder, uh, this presentation should be up on our YouTube channel fairly shortly. Uh, and so for anyone who wants to go through the details of uh, tracking something more carefully or to look at the resources, it'll be available. And that concludes this webinar. Great. Thank you.